many a band has broken by having their music featured in films and television, proving that producers of those films aren't necessarily taking just a standard approach, but a really detailed approach at how music can really develop something. But how do you get the attention of those that make the decisions about what artist, how you deal with it, what songs are right for the film, and if approached, how do you, as an artist or a songwriter, deal with it? And that's what this really critically important panel is all about. It's presented by the OMDC, and we'll be discussing, and the person that's going to be leading this is a, an outstanding musician in his own right, but also someone that cares for songwriting and the creative side. He's the Senior Director of Film and Television Music at ASCAP. I'm sure you all know ASCAP in LA, where decisions like this are made every day. So please welcome onto the Canadian Music Week stage, Michael Todd from ASCAP. Perfect. How's everybody doing? Well, I guess I don't need to introduce myself, um, but I'm honored to uh, moderate this esteemed group of professionals to discuss the topic, putting your music in film. I think we all agree the landscape of opportunities is actually much broader than just film. So, you know, we're going to talk about other forms of visual media as well, like television, commercials, any place where there's areas of opportunity with potential income. So, uh, since our time's a little limited, you know, about 50 minutes or so, we're gonna save the Q&A for the last 10, 15 minutes, and uh, so please hold on to your questions. I'll start with asking everyone in the room who's, who's here, how many of you are songwriters or artists? So we have a healthy, healthy number there. And just to put in perspective, how about composers who actually compose underscore for film, TV, anything? All right, that's pretty good too. And then how about any filmmakers or producers? Okay, just a few. So that, that'll help put our questions in context and how we want to direct this. I guess first, um, it'd be good to just introduce some of the guys here, keep it kind of brief. On my immediate left, I have Billy Gottlieb. He's a music supervisor with Playback Music. He's done shows like Fringe, he's on some new shows, The 100, Gang Related, also the Nick Jonas film, Careful What You Wish For, and David Heyman to his left, he's a music supervisor, supersonic creative, basically does deals worldwide, TV shows here in Canada like Saving Hope and Rookie Blue, but also the indie film The Dirties, ads like Chevy, Mazda, Ryanair, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this transmedia storytelling that we were uh, talking backstage earlier. Also, we have Richard Glasser to his left. He's the executive in charge of music and film and TV for Weinstein Company. Uh, worked on some pretty known films like Silver Lining Playbook, The Butler. And he's also produced some soundtracks. 28, I think, is the count up to date. Uh, movies like Butler and even Mandela Long Walk to Freedom won some Golden Globes. And on the far left, we have Stephen Scharf. He's president of Stephen Scharf Entertainment and senior VP of creative for Carlin America. He manages composers and producers, uh, licenses indie artists uh, like Grand Analog and Matt Anderson and animated shorts. He works, uh, represents composers with uh, animated shorts for Pixar, just to name a few things. And I believe we do have on Skype uh, Candace Hansen, who's an attorney and partner of the law firm uh, very reputable and established in the entertainment industry. I think I see you right there. I'm here. All right. Um, get my first question here. Billy yes. and uh, David, you're both music supervisors. So, what does that actually mean, and how do you find your music? You want to jump on this? Sure. Uh, music supervisor, I think, is the go-between, the short bridge between the music industry and the producers and the content creators that hire us to bring music and breathe life into their productions. So we curate music, we negotiate it, and ultimately license it. But in between that, there's a whole dance that we do with the producers that we work with to achieve uh, synchronization, which is the harmony of picture and sound. It's definitely a dance. Is this working? Yes, okay. So um, supervision, yeah, you're basically the conduit to getting the music that exists in the universe into that tiny little project that you are focused on for however many years. 
or months or weeks or whatever it is. But in terms of finding music, um, you know, there's a lot of publishers, a lot of uh, labels who I'm on their radar and they just kind of pitch and pitch and pitch. Somebody like Steve, who I've known for many, many years, he will stay on top of what the projects are, what's floating around, and um, the good ones, like Steve, will know what the actual content of the projects are and not just pitch you some random uh, artist that may or may not work, but things that are more specific to the tone of the project. So that's one way. Also, you know, uh, like there's sites like CD Baby, if you guys are familiar, I don't know, I've, I found some really great independent artists through there. And then uh, just going to shows a lot. Living in LA, there's a lot of artists that come through, so uh, I get to see some really great musicians who I normally wouldn't be exposed to um, outside of maybe the LA area, things like that. You mentioned CD Baby. Is that, does that mean that you, you scour through CD Baby, or is there actually someone at CD Baby it, that you communicate with and actually pitches to you? If there is, I'm not aware of that person, <laughs> and I'm going to meet them. Um, no, I, I do my own scouring. Got it. So, All right. um, but you know, like uh, YouTube's a great resource. I mean, the web is just a great resource. You know, I started prior to the web being so prolific in in terms of how music is is uh, getting around, and it's it's really made life a lot easier for me. I'm big on blogs. I mean, I like to obviously know that I like something and know that it sits with me well, but I definitely like the reassurance that other people enjoy it and also get a sense of who you are and uh, how you're presenting yourself to the public. That's important for me because, you know, we'll t maybe touch on transmedia, but as you want to move your brands when you have an advertising opportunity to potentially get you as a band in front of the camera to share your likeness with the world. I want to see that you're ready. I want to see how other people talk about you. So I'm still a sort of traditionalist. I like to see what the press says and also have it confirmed with my own taste. And, and that also, I guess, provides immediate feedback to connect you with I guess, the audience. Well, we're being pitched all the time. So when I'm seeing stuff being pitched and then when I'm doing my own blog roles, I call them every, you know, Friday morning I'll get up and at the end of the week I'll go through everything. If I see those bands come up again and again, mm -hmm. I'll even download it again and again just so it comes up in my iTunes frequently and I know that that is something that it's popping. Yeah. And I uh, caught a little bit of PJ Bloom earlier and he was referencing his, his access to sync agencies or song placement organizations. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Do you have any people you go to or who come to you and you, have, you, t you, know, you trust? Guys like Steve, I mean, that's definitely, um, I've known Steve since I started working as a music supervisor 10 years ago, um, and those people are truly the best people to service your music. It's truly difficult to hammer us as an independent artist. We sometimes don't appreciate it. It often doesn't come off right. Having a professional like Steve, to take, uh, take a grasp of your music is super important. Cool. Well, Richard, all right, your job is similar at the Weinstein Company, but is your role any different than a music supervisor? Um, well, everything, everything for film comes by my desk, and usually it starts off with a script and some type of package. And I'll go through the script, and a lot, a lot of times there'll be pre-records, pre which we need you know, to do first. And then I'll follow the script through the development stage and then eventually uh, on the big screen. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you're working with indie bands and, and how that's been? Yeah, um, we, we have kind of a unique situation uh, that I started at the Weinstein Company about four years ago. Uh, we took our um, franchise films like Piranha and Scary Movie and Scream and uh, we're doing a new film called Amityville Horror. Uh, and what I decided to do is I'm very big into indie bands, unsigned bands. Uh, and I started to uh, set up a Dropbox of songs that the director liked. And then we went to indie bands uh, and we got them to do their own thing of something that felt like the song or that was close to. And it was a process of elimination and uh, we just finished a film uh, last year, Scary Movie 5, and I used 22 indie bands. And a lot of bands are getting recognition now uh, because of the exposure from film. Cool. Um, I think I'm gonna jump over to Candace on our, on our screen here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the basic rights you know, we're talking a lot about opportunities and getting songs. 
uh, placed and, and how to find them, but can we touch on you know, both the sound recording and the underlying work and I guess what a songwriter should be aware of? There's two elements to putting your music in film. One is the actual song composition and the other is the master recording that embodies the song. And those are two distinct copyrights and they can be owned by different people. So the, when you're dealing with a motion picture, you need a synchronization license for the song, which entitles the producer to synchronize your underlying music with the picture and then to broadcast that and telecast that into films, theaters around the world. And in the United States, part of that license includes the right to perform the song in theaters without paying performing rights royalties. That's an anomaly in the United States. In every other country of the world, when the song is performed in theaters, there is a license fee that is paid to the underlying writer and publisher, but not in the United States. So that is part of the grant of rights. As when you're putting your music in film, often the producers are also going to ask you to give them the right to use the song in a soundtrack album. And uh, as you know, there are mechanical royalty rates for soundtrack albums that are set in the United States and Canada as a per a, a penny rate, they will often ask for what's called a three-quarter rate as part of that license, which pretty much everybody agrees to. In terms of the master recording, you've got whoever owns that recording, which often is going to be the songwriters in this case, if they're recording artists, or it could be another artist who's recorded it. That's going to be a master license that allows the producers to synchronize the master into the picture. And similarly with, with the synchronization license, your master recording license is often going to specify a royalty rate if your master is included in the soundtrack album. That's generally considered a happy occurrence. Now, on the publishing side, the great part about putting your song into a film is that when that film plays in theaters or is then formed on television, so can, or, and all of the other societies, are going to collect performing rights royalties. And this is based on when your song's in the picture, the producer, prepares a cue sheet that lists all of the music in the picture. It'll identify the songwriters and the publishers of the song. And that's how that money gets collected around the world and repaid to you writers back by your local society. Yeah, Candice, yeah, you mentioned the word cue sheet. I think that's real important for everyone to understand how that can impact you actually collecting your money. It's really important at the point of when you're licensing your song, if, if you're an individual and you're representing your works, both the master and the sync as the publisher, you know, to either David or Billy or any other music supervisor in that position, whether it's the production company, it's important that you include in the language that you have access to getting a copy of that cue sheet because that's your only recourse. Or in other words, it's kind of think of it as an invoice. That's your proof to the, uh, to the collection society, the Performing Rights Society, for you to get paid in the future because the payments don't happen right away. It happens down the road as it's being collected and then it has to go through the internal channels to make those distributions based on matching the cue sheet and performance data from if it's theaters, you're, you're dealing with you know, the societies in those countries. Yeah, and then if it's television, it would be just per the monitoring of that data, the performance data with each society in, in that country as well. That's correct. If you, if, when you're dealing with smaller producers, it's actually really important to follow up and make sure that they submit the cue sheet to the local society. Because some of them don't do it, don't know they're supposed to do it, and it's up to the producer of the film to submit the cue sheet. So you have to stay on them. Um, 
Candice, are there, can I ask you, are there any other important deal points that a songwriter or a band should pay attention to when they're in this position and have this opportunity? Yes, absolutely. So one of the most important aspects from anybody's point of view is going to be the money, okay? The fee that's paid to you. Uh, you know, when you're starting out, obviously the fee can be pretty low down to nothing just for the privilege of having your song in a picture, your master in a picture, and getting cue sheet credit as a writer and also getting a screen credit, which you want, even though the, the music credits in a picture tend to be at the very end of the film when almost no one's watching, it's still important to get credit. Also, you're going to find that in some cases, the filmmakers, particularly if they have submitted to you the idea or come to you to write a song, the production company is going to request all of the publisher's share or a piece of the publishing. So I think most people in the room know that in the songwriting business, the public performance royalties and the other income are divided 50-50 between the songwriter and the publisher. Now, when you're starting out and you don't have a deal with anyone else, you are the songwriter and the publisher. But it's possible to divide up that publishing income and assign the collection and ownership to different entities. Now, if you've entered into a publishing deal, say with Olay, they're already going to be their publisher and they're actually going to control putting the song in the movie and making that deal. Even then, a production company could still ask Ole for a piece of the publishing uh, or and calculate it in different ways. It could relate only to the performance of the film. It could relate to uh, the royalties from the soundtrack album. Now, on the soundtrack album, you're getting your mechanical royalty as a songwriter, but the recording artist or master owner is getting a royalty from the record. So there's two streams of income there. Um, again, credit and fees are the most important aspects of the deal. Uh, these deals are granted in perpetuity, uh, sometimes in television, which I know is not really the focus of our, our deal here, but sometimes in television they will take shorter deals and perhaps limit them to just the territory of Canada or Canada, the US, the rest of the world, depending on what rights they need. Those are devices to really allow the producer to pay less money um, because the fewer rights they take, the less they're going to pay. From your point of view as a starting out songwriter, you're gonna be happy just to have your work in a motion picture and the fee could be anywhere from zero on up. Now, I just, Richard Glasser and I just worked together on the Mandela Long Walk to Freedom movie in which I represented you two who were asked to write an original song and record it for the picture. That is a totally different level of deal um, and I'm hoping you all get there to be able to make those kinds of deals. Yeah, Candace is a very tough negotiator, but I love her to death. <laughs> but one well, thing, one company, but it all worked out in the end. Uh, thank you, Candace. <laughs> One thing to do is to protect yourself as songwriters uh, for TV and, and film companies, they will try to take advantage of, of young songwriters and say, well, we're giving you this opportunity to put the song in the film, so therefore we're going to take your, your publishing. You'll always get your songwriting, like what Candace is saying, it's 50-50, so you'll always have your songwriting credit regardless of who has the publishing. But they're going to try to take your publishing as well, and you definitely don't want to do that if you, if you can avoid it, because that's your mailbox money down the road, and all these residuals that everybody's talking about, you know, they could be $15, they could be $30, but as they amortize over the years, you know, you'll start to see, let's say you get $500 for the licensing fee, you could see several thousand dollars over time from the royalty. So it's really important to try to hold on to your publishing, unless they won't do the deal otherwise, but um, nine times out of 10, the, the studio will back down and allow you to keep your publishing. That's good insight. I mean, I think it's really important what he's stressing here about the word publishing. I mean, that's, that is the entity that controls the copyright. So not only does that apply to this film, but by being the publisher, that allows you the right 
to use it again somewhere else. Now, if you give that away, you don't necessarily have that choice. You can't just go out and say, oh yeah, I used my song in this film, I did it in this film. Well, that's gonna be up to the publisher. So it's real important to understand the impact of that. Um, Stephen, we did talk to you, uh, you know, we were actually pointing to you earlier because David and Billy has some working relationship with you, but how do you decide what songwriters or catalogs or film and TV composers to represent? Well, that's a pretty loaded question. It all comes down to uh, great quality and, and the right fit for what you need. I mean, at Carl in America, we're a very big heritage publishing company. We own 200,000 copyrights. Uh, occasionally, I'll sign new writers over the years uh, that make sense, but a lot of times it's taking the great copyrights we have from ACDC, The Love and Spoonful, Turtles, James Brown, Bobby Darren, uh, Jim Steinman, you know, and, and recently Bruce Coburn, uh, and placing that in film and TV. Um, I, I've had a nice opportunity in the last couple years to work with David, both with Bruce Coburn on one of your HBO shows up here that we ended up doing, and a, a phenomenal license with Essie Jane, who was a British writer I signed to Carlin many years ago in Saving Hope, and that was a, a, an incredible place. Uh, we also back covered then. Bruce. Hmm? We covered Bruce Coburn. Yeah, as yeah. Well for a film. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so it really comes down to the quality. And again, every publishing company has a different culture. So you have to know how your company operates and what's right for them. We don't normally go after just signing a million new writers all the time. Over the years, I've signed handfuls of new songwriters that make sense to develop. The development curve takes a very long time. But I do work, again, with great, great giant artists and, you know, uh, place many, many copyrights in, in so many different uh, projects. Uh, with ACDC recently, we, we have the Planes movie coming out uh, with Thunderstruck, the trailer campaign. Um, I'm actually doing the, uh, the animated short with one of my composers in LA, Zane Effendi, on the Planes film as well right now. And, and, uh, but it, it really comes down to really knowing what's the right fit. For the independent artists that I work with, again, it's across the board, multi-genre. I like all kinds of music, but it's gotta be something I feel has uniqueness to it. It's not just sort of middle of the road. It has something, some kind of quality that I feel can really make the grade and get going. But something Candace mentioned about cue sheets, I'd like to throw this in. I cannot tell you how many times, as I get cue sheets on every license that we do, are wrong from major studios. So many times. I've had to chase down all kinds of people to make sure the cue sheets were done properly. The timings were off. I had one case with one of my artists in True Blood on HBO a couple of years ago uh, where they were ASCAP writers and they put them down as BMI writers. It was nuts. So you really have to watch it like a hawk and make sure that everything is right. And I make sure I, I get copies of those cue sheets, especially for my independent artists, to give them so we can get it filed properly and they can get paid at the end of the day. Hey, you know, um, just to add to that, um, uh, the Weinstein Company, we're, we get very involved, like we did with Candace, with groups doing uh, songs for a movie, especially in titles or in the body of the film. And last year we were very fortunate, besides uh, working with Candace, that we uh, approached Taylor Swift to write a song for a movie called One Chance, uh, and also, you, um, also Kings of Leon uh, for a movie called August Ocean's County. And the way we approach that with a platinum artist or a big artist is we show them the film. And nine out of 10 times, the artist falls in love with the film and we make a deal. So, uh, that's just the way we work, and it's been very successful for us. Richard, I know you'd mentioned earlier about the indie artists. How do you find them? How are, you, how are, how are they coming to you? Well, um, <clears throat> a lot of the indie artists, we go through different companies, placement companies, uh, like musicsupervisor.com, or music dealers, or um, I forget Eddie Caldwell's uh, uh, company. Do you know uh, what it's called? Yeah, and Taxi. Uh, the thing I can tell you, uh, if you're a songwriter and you're trying to get placements, uh, it's very important to us that you go through a legitimate company. 
because so many times I'll deal once in a while with an individual artist and all of a sudden another writer pops up or they really don't own that piece of the publishing. So we have to be very careful when we're looking for material that all the rights are cleared and uh, you know, so we can put it in the film. And I'd just like to point out the opposite side of that coin for a second because um, there are a lot of productions that aren't Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein Company productions out there. Tons of being uh, produced, produced the independent films. Under $3 million are being done yearly, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And it's an opportunity for small bands, the bands that are playing the Rivoli, the Horseshoe, um, whether you're playing Free Times Cafe this week, doesn't mean you don't have an opportunity to be in these films. I, Steve, am not looking for quality. Not always at all. I am looking for the beautiful songs. And to me, a song can overcome quality in many ways. I've licensed the rawest of raw for the end of television shows because it's just, you know, a single songwriter on a guitar and I like to feel the notes and the texture. And uh, I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. When I say quality, I mean well, not I, I shitty don't, I don't music. Want to, I don't want to well, um, discourage anyone in the room who is doing songs as if they're a singer-songwriter in their basement because I have placed people that are just, you know, nobodies, frankly, and we've gotten them on a show like Rookie Blue and gotten them 15 million views. But how, how do you protect, how do you protect the company that you're working for from not knowing whether all the rights are intact or not? It's a lot more footwork, I imagine. Um, I have to contact the artist, get the assurance that he wrote it on his own. What if somebody pops up and now the production company's liable? We handle that. Yeah. Well, we, we're, we're a bit more cowboy, and uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's really important as a, as a licensing company. I can tell you from doing this with independent artists, I do exclusive deals. Any of the really top flight independent sync companies only do exclusive deals. That's for two reasons. Protection for us with our relationships with the supervisors, that they don't get multiply pitched by many different people with the same song, which will piss them off, they don't know how to make the deal, they'll shut down on everybody. And it's so nobody else has that song. And I do very big due diligence with making sure there's no samples, there's total clearance that I can have for my writers and, 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 the, and the songs that I'm pitching. So when I send music to people, like David, Billy, Richard, anybody out there, they know I can stand behind it and they're not gonna have an issue when it comes to licensing the music. And that's really, really important because there are a lot of up and coming and, and small sync companies that are out there that don't do that work, especially the ones that are uh, non-exclusive. They do not really do their homework and you, don't, you do not wanna get a supervisor in a studio and a sling of shit with having the rights not cleared properly. It's really bad. Billy, have you had that happen? Where you've had a song come from multiple sources? I have. And, and what was the result of that? And how did that impact your relationship with either source? Um, I do that, huh? That's weird. I could have sworn that song came from somebody else. And you know, sometimes, uh, a few years ago, there was a, a trend where they were doing retitling. So you, know, you would uh, have the same song with different titles, and that's even more confusing. Um, you know, I get it, uh, you know, everybody wants to try to hustle these songs and the more people that are pushing your songs, you feel like the more opportunities you, you have, but it, it does rub feathers, uh, ruffle the feathers, if you will, the supervisors, and it just, it just becomes confusing and it doesn't feel honest and once you break a trust, once you break the trust, then you're going to have a, a little bit of a difficulty trying to regain that trust and um, have that working relationship be as smooth as possible. So it's something you want to avoid. I don't particularly care for it, and it, it, just, it just rubs me the wrong way, and I just don't feel like it's honest. But uh, one more thing that I will say, um, you were talking about cue sheets and stuff like that. Just make sure your writer shares, all your splits are all taken care of, because that sometimes is one of the biggest flags that seems to pop up where, you know, you, it's your song, but you co-wrote it, and you don't have the percentages, and the splits are all handled. And, once you, when you present a song to somebody who's going to license it for TV, film, whatever it is, you definitely want to have all your, as they say, ducks in a row, because if not, then it's on us to start dealing with all the, uh, you know, like you say, footwork. We got so much to do. The last thing I want to start doing is chasing writers and trying to figure out what the percentage and the splits are. 
just please have everything in, in line and, and um, it'll be a much easier process and we'll be much more likely to come back to you and say, hey, what else do you have? Or what other songs are you, are you sitting on? Because that's the experience we want to deal with. We don't want hassles, we don't want problems and like any, in, in any business. You know, I run across on uh, music cue sheets because I, every music cue sheet at the Weinstein Company falls by my desk and I have to okay it and approve it uh, from the music editor, which normally prepares. But I'm seeing a, a lot of cue sheets come by where um, there'll be the writer's share and then it'll say self-published, okay? Well, I bl believe the societies, when it's self-published, unless you tell that particular artist to open up a company with ASCAP or BMI or the local affiliate, you really need to do that, and I try to advise these songwriters, you have to have a company in order to collect that publishing right. And that's easy to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really important, if you're an independent artist out here, uh, to align yourself with a good sync company that will do that work. They will take care of clearing everything and making sure that the cue sheets are done right. It's so, so important. I mean, an another issue that happened to me a few years ago, I won't name the show, but it was with Sony TV Studios. I had a song in, in a prominent use in, in a particular episode of a show, and on the confirmation request, uh, it said it was gonna run for a minute. Well, of course, I watch all these shows. I make sure I tape them and see them. And I'm watching the show, I'm hearing my song, and I'm going, whoa, wait a second. Three and a half minutes it was used. <laughs> so I called Sony back up. I said, I think you better take a look at the episode. You know, and they did, and they revised the whole sheet and everything, because that's a tremendous amount more money. If you have a song playing a minute or less, it falls under a different frame of payment something that's almost to full use, you get a lot more money. And it, it's a, it was a bigger difference for my client and for us. Steve, so. did you go to, uh, did you ask for more money for the use, just out of curiosity, because it was three minutes as opposed to uh, the initial minute that they had in? No, because I actually got a good amount of money for, that's, for the use. That's but the we ended up getting probably twice as much on the back end. Sure. Because of that. So. You know, when, I, when I try to go after songs, uh, usually, when I send out for a quote uh, for either the master or the sync, I'll usually, uh, if I'm not sure of the timing at the time or, or the music editor's not sure, I'll usually go up to a certain amount of time or up to full use of the song. Yeah. Or, or up to the discretion of the editor. Yes. Can I just interject here about the cue sheets? So, just so everybody knows, the cue sheet lists the song title, where it appears in the film, how long it plays, who the writers are, who the publishers are, often it lists the artist, if there's an artist, but it also lists whether it's used basically as an instrumental or a vocal, and background or foreground. And the societies pay differing amounts of performance royalties based on background and foreground, Visual vocal, you can visual vocal means you can see the source, the music's coming out of a radio or someone's performing it on screen, and the duration. Similarly, your license fee, uh, if you have the ability you know, to have any leverage to negotiate, will be based on the timing of the use in the picture and what kind of a use it is. And also, by the way, main title or end title credit uses are worth more money than just being a background cue in the body of the film. Absolutely. And also none of this is in play, by the way, in Canada when it comes to what I think is the big winner for independent artists when they have the opportunity to land on a commercial. So in Canada, there is no royalty system for commercial uses. You get your master use and your publishing um, synchronization use payment. Well, that's it. End of day, you can work in a renewal fee, but there's no royalties. But we have situations where um, there's global brands doing global sp spots, like Jack Daniels Global's here, Mazda Global's here, Chevy Global's here, and they're putting stuff in South America, they're putting stuff in the, in the UK. So you still have to have those ducks in a row because 
because when it does sort of export into different markets, you will see royalties. But in Canada, as far as a lot of you are concerned, you could be on a TELUS commercial tomorrow and you're going to get about five, ten times as much as you would expect to be in a, in a standard Canadian television show. Yeah, in the U.S. Yeah. you can collect on that. Yeah. I think it's uh, important to manage expectations, though. It's not a one-size-fits-all, fit, you know, on the back end uh, as a songwriter or a song being used. I mean, you know, it dep you got to consider the source. You know, if you have a song on Animal Planet, it's going to be, you know, 10, 20, 30 times less than it would be on a primetime network show. You know, for us, for, for ASCAP, speaking, you know, from that in the U.S., it's also time of day, as well as usage, as Candace was saying, and, and how long that's actually playing, down to the second. You know, so all those things are factors, but one thing you want to keep in mind is if you have this opportunity to license your song, and someone on the other side is saying, we don't have much money up front, but you'll make a lot of money on the back end, you've got to do your homework, because that's not always necessarily true. You know, I, um, I, I would totally agree. I mean, I have to say that uh, one of my Canadian artists that I've worked with for many years, Grand Analog, um, I've had over 20 placements on television shows in the States for them. It's been really great. And I, and I just landed a North American Wendy's TV commercial for them, uh, which is on TV, radio, internet, US, Canada, Mexico for a year. And it was a tremendously huge deal. And we are going to see back-end royalties from TV and radio in the United States because they do pay for that, um, but not up here in Canada, as David pointed out. But again, it depends on where those commercials run. And, and, and if you're lucky enough to get one of those, it's a very big payday for everybody. I would, yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that uh, uh, when we do trailers, um, which is an area in the U.S. where they pay off of the cue sheet. Uh, we'll file a cue sheet for that particular trailer because there's a lot of, lot of songs. There may be 20 songs in one trailer, yeah. but, uh, uh, but the performance societies do pay on that as yeah. long as it's... That's great. actually a pretty good source of income uh, yes. on the front end as well. Tra trailers and are amazing. Trailers and ads. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on I do end. tons of trailers with Carlin and also with some of my indie acts too, but especially with the bigger artists. Um, on the Iron Man 2 film, which we had ACDC all over that film, we had four songs in the movie, we had three different trailer campaigns, at least on that, and a full soundtrack. It, it's tremendous amount of money, tremendous. I, mean, I, I have another opportunity question for the songwriters in the audience, um, uh, and maybe all you can chime on this. Um, what do you do when a filmmaker or director has their heart set on a song that's out of his or her price range? It's something that you know, they love, they've gotten used to it, but they can't afford it because the publisher, the master, owner won't do that deal. Um, I'm looking at that as possibly an opportunity to do, you know, cut a, a sound alike or something. I don't like sound alikes. I like to think there's always a unique opportunity to up what has been sort of get put out there by the director. I think that a lot of directors are pretty much on the ball, but still their taste maybe is even if they think they're on the edge, it's still two years back. Um, so we're getting good references, but I like to always think that I can beat it with something in the independent world. And you're talking about my world because I don't work on huge films, and you know directors have a certain language and a limitation, so they do dip into you know Thunderstruck is on everything that I do, <laughs> and I have to replace it, Steve. So you know it's. Just I mean, a lot, a lot of times uh, when we get a song from a director, you know, a director will tempt. In and it, it, that's when they, uh, they'll temp in music for the whole film before uh, we decide on what songs we're going to use. The problem with temping is the director falls in love with that particular song and it's hard temp to love. take it out. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and what happens is sometimes I'll talk to the director in, in a lot of cases and have them uh, will try to clear the publishing for a reasonable price and then have them, will spend the money to re-record that with another artist. And that happens a lot. And that's yeah. exciting. I, I I've had a whole campaign well. at Carlin over the last few years um, with, with Owning Masters, where we've gone out and, and recorded a lot of our songs with new versions of the songs, male, female, instrumental versions, to try to have an alternative for people. Now, it, it, it's not going to always work like in a big film or a big television show. 
but I recently had a promo campaign for American Idol with Happy Together where they wanted, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on the master, so I gave them one of our versions, which they loved, and it ran for two weeks. It was a really good amount of money, and it was a win-win for everybody. And I've done that with a number of situations, but I think when it comes down to really, you know, active films that are coming out, they want something really real. They want something that's either recognizable or if it's a brand new indie act, something that's really going to emote and make sense in the particular scene. Billy? Yeah, a lot of times uh, when you find yourself in that position and the money's not there but the uh, filmmakers really want to use that song, uh, it depends on the project. Like if you have a real interesting project that uh, is kind of like a labor of love or it's, you know, the subject matter is really kind of interesting or important. You can use that angle and you know it's not always about money which is the good thing and you know these you're still artists at the end of the day and you have a conversation a lot of times i like to put the artists on the phone with the directors so then they can have an artist to artist conversation where it's not you know somebody like me who you know fancies himself an artist but isn't truly an artist um and then they can have that dialogue and then you can kind of knock down the whole corporate aspect of well we got no disrespect but lawyers and business affairs people and things like that, and then that connection will, um, will a lot of times, things will, nice, nice things will come out of that. Um, so it's always great to be part of something that's really super cool or really super interesting, or, uh, but it, there's also times where you, know, you can just call people and cry. I've done that. I've also um, I've done things I'm really ashamed to talk about. That just I send pictures like, of puppies. Uh, do do yeah, puppies? I do puppy pictures. Richard? Yeah. Very soft uh, there's in, in, in a lot of songs, when you're dealing directly with the artist, and Candace will know this, there's a, in the contract there's a re-record restriction. And usually when that re-record description expires, the artist can cut their own uh, song again. And I can't tell you how many times I've licensed a song directly from the songwriter uh, that sounds just about 90% close. And sometimes it's even better because if the song is, uh, let's say, cut five years ago and the re-record restriction, usually they're three to four years. It just depends on the negotiation. Uh, a lot of times that song sounds more current now to what we're doing. So that's a big help. Uh, well. Absolutely. You agree, well, Candace, you know all about Candace, that. you had something to add? Yeah, what, what Richard's talking about is when you sign a record contract, an exclusive record contract, there is always a provision on the contract that says that, that the artist will not re-record any of the songs that were recorded under the record deal for a certain period of time. It's usually keyed off when the record deal ends or when the song was last uh, recorded and it's about five years after when the record deal ends. So if the producer wants to use the original master, as we've said, they've got to go to the record company that owns the master and they've got to deal with the songwriter or publisher. And normally in the business, the master fee and the publishing fee are equal. So if it's 5000 for the master, it's 5000 for the sync license for the song. And they usually now, call that all in, don't they, Candace? MFN. Yes, all in. So when you're or doing at really well. higher levels, where you know these fees are up in the fifty, hundred thousand, and beyond, it's often cost effective for the producer to get another recorded version. And Richard's right; there are a lot of artists and a lot of publishers who are having their own versions of the masters re-recorded, including by the original artists, so that the publisher is now doing what we call one-stop shopping. They can license the master and the song. Absolutely. And this makes it really easy for people like Richard and for the music supervisors to deal with only one entity. Okay, now you gotta be, in, in the case of not the original artist, but in, in the case where you're covering the song because uh, the master's too expensive, you've gotta be careful of doing too much of a sound alike because there have been cases in the past involving people like Bette Midler and Tom Waits where oh. they've actually taken action because someone really, <coughs> I duplicated their master to the extent that when you listen to it, you would think that it was the original artist. What you can't do, what Candace is saying, is you cannot copy the vocal to be exactly the same. 
We have that in our writer agreements with, with all of our songwriters at Carlin. When we've done our re-records, we make sure that the vocals don't sound exactly like the original artist. It's close, but not enough where we don't have that issue. The tracks could be exactly the same if you want to do it that way, but not the vocal. And that's how you get around that, because that was that landmark case with Bette Midler. It was really something. Really? But you know, there's also the case of artists like I work with the Turtles. They got screwed many years ago by their original record company on never seeing royalties, and they won their masters back. So they actually own their original recording. So when we license their music, you know, they, they get the money, not the record company. Before we get into Q&A, because we're almost out of time, um, I think the common thread here for the songwriters in the audience or creators of music, um, what, the common element that everyone's looking for, you were saying, it's not necessarily production, but it's quality. And, and I think it's some, some emotional quality that you connect with, right? Because that's what you're dealing with. You're supporting a story to picture. You're supporting you know, an emotional connection to that. So is there anything that you guys can add to that if, you know, advice to the audience is, as far as, you know, opportunities to be thinking about when you're recording your song, to, if you want it syncable or placeable? Yeah, um, my suggestion, I tell people this all the time, uh, your trade papers, your Hollywood Reporter, Variety, IMDb, uh, they tell you the production charts of what's going on and, you know, it never hurts for you to call and talk to who the music supervisor is attached to that particular film. Um, that's really, really important um, in, in doing that, and, and that'll help you a lot. I, I mean, I just, who are the writers in the room? Who are the songwriters in the room? You can put up your hand. Write a good song. Yeah. Film festivals, by the way. Simple. Film festivals. You'll cut through. Good music will cut through. It'll find their way to us, and you know, as much as you need to be at these things and meet people, you need to be focusing on your creative Well, I stuff. think that adds a point. One thing I always tell aspiring writers or whatever, you gotta have a team. You can't do it by yourself. Exactly. If you're gonna reach these people, you're focusing on the craft and writing that great song. And you gotta do that a lot. That takes a lot of time. So in order to get your music to these people up here, you gotta have other people representing you. And it's gonna legitimize you more anyway, instead Absolutely. of selling yourself. I guarantee you that. And do, um, what, do what we do. You know, we're yeah. going through music and finding out what's the newest, latest thing. I think that's your responsibility as an artist, whether you're in that genre or not, just to be aware of what's there and be aware of the past. I mean, the past repeats itself over and over. As a sync company, we're a filter for the supervisors. We are looking at what we have, and it's really important for our job to know exactly what they need for a show. I'm not going to send music to somebody if, if it's not the right fit. If, if they're looking for no a particular how good style, it is. I will not do it. Because there's great songs, but it's got to fit the scene. Yeah, also, uh, uh, it's very important that you, when you're making the deal, you make sure you get a, a lawyer to look over the agreement. It's so important uh, because it could affect your career moving forward. We're going to need to wrap it up. Yes, Thanks okay. for your time. Uh, hopefully this is informative. Thank you very much. Thank the, the panelists. Thank you.